Our next speaker, Lara Setrakian, who's sitting in the corner here. If you know Lara, you know commitment and dedication. Uh, commitment in getting the important stories that are happening right now, today, out to the rest of the world and making sure that we learn, we understand, and not just pass by what is happening uh, around the world. Lara worked for a number of legacy news outlets, uh, primarily in the Middle East, uh, reporting on some of the biggest stories uh, of the last decade. Um, I remember, excuse me, I, I remember in 2009, um, Lara and I were on the phone um, a lot when things were happening in Iran. Um, after that, uh, when the Syrian uh, conflict broke out, um, so did Lara. Lara decided that the way the news about Syria was being reported was not good enough and that we needed to know what was happening in Syria in a totally, completely different way. And that's where the innovation came. That's called Syria D Deeply. And Syria Deeply went into News Deeply and then Ebola Deeply. And now she's leading as the CEO and founder of News Deeply a giant startup on the verge of making it big. So be prepared to be energized by Lara Satrakian. Oh boy. I'm so happy. I'm so happy. I, I love you guys. And that's easy to say to a room when you're related to half of the people in the room. But beyond that, I mean, I, I, I will bring the energy. Everyone knows I do, but I don't, I don't feel hyper right now. I just feel like I'm in love with us. There's a time for mourning, and there's a time for building. And we are clearly in the time of building. And I kind of, I think about us a lot, in fact, and I'm going to give you the untold version of this story. You're going to get all the juicy secrets. Doing what I felt was right gave me more gifts than I ever could have imagined. And one of those gifts was a journey home. Because of what I did for Syria and the Arab Spring, I was invited to speak at a conference in Aintab, also known as Gaziantep, known to my family as home. So I broke through that personal wall of whether I'd ever see where we're really from. And now I, I go freely, you know, frozen exile. It unfroze for me. And I learned that normalization isn't just for diplomats, it's for us. So I got to go home again. And that's just one of the many things that happened for me. So whenever I actually, after I went on that trip, which I'm happy to share more about, it was pretty magical, some great things happened. Um, I went to the Hammam, which was a 500-year-old Hammam in Aintab, and my Turkish friend, my Turkish sister who showed me around, who was most certainly my neighbor circa 100 years ago, her mother took me to the Hammam, spoke not a word of English. I've never told this story in public. And she started, she poured the water over my head and she started scrubbing me with that olive oil soap like I was a kid, like a seven-year-old kid. So I got to be a kid in that hammam where my grandparents and great-grandparents would have had their weekly washing. And when I was in that moment, I was so grateful and so moved it was all still there, whatever was there. I just wanted you to have that. I wanted everyone to have that so much that when I went over to the next town to do my reporting, I just started crying to this wonderful Turkish man who was so kind and took me and was having me over for tea and I just started crying, trying try to understand why I'm crying. And I said, because I got to the other side of the river and I want everyone to get there too. I don't want us to be sad anymore. And I don't want us to be afraid anymore. And most of all, I don't want our women to do less than they can anymore. I don't know what it was like 100 years ago. I do know that Eintub was known for two things, strong women and spicy food. And when I was there, I asked them, are those two things connected? And they said, of course. So we were something once, 
and we've been something lately, and I want to be who we are again. So before I jump in and tell you what I did in media and what I'm doing now and all the technology, I just want to say we should never be less than we can be ever again. For all the women who saw their dreams shortened, who didn't get to go to the medical school of their choice or didn't get to do what they wanted to do, we should be letting our girls fly. We should be sewing their wings on and letting them fly. And part of the reason I won't stop is because so many Armenian women had to. So with that, I will give you the story of what got me here. Is Sesu Kachishan here? She's one of the most important women in my life. She's the woman who wrote me every birthday card. So did Auntie Grace. She's also here too. This is tough. This is a tough one. But someone for me like Cecil Kishishan is the woman who represents everything we can be and should be. So this is for you. So when I, funny thing, right? So like three, four years ago, I used to be a girl on TV. And I, now I have a website. And that actual sentence came out of my mother's mouth as, you were on TV and you left it for a website. <laughs> and I didn't even imitate her accent here because it's moot in this crowd. So, but when I left TV, I felt bad. I was like, am I letting Armenians down? Like I used to be another Armenian on TV. Are they just, just let down, right? Kind of a let down. So I'm kind of amazed that you're having me here to talk because I thought it was kind of over. And actually, that was another big part of the story is that I kind of decided that doing what I wanted to do was the most important, it's not just what I want, doing what I felt was right, was more important than the airtime, which is really hard when you're on TV because all that matters is your airtime. So I kind of said to myself, it's all right if I'm a nobody, so to speak, right? Like if you're on TV, you're somebody because you're on TV, but all right, okay, fine. If I end up a nobody, but I do the thing that I think I must do, that's fine. And it kind of made me more of a somebody, which is ridiculous. So here was me back then, Middle East correspondent for ABC News and Bloomberg Television. It was my dream job. I was living in Dubai, covering the Arab world and Iran. The original assignment was when I was, when I was 25 years old. I had been working so hard, so long at ABC in New York that they said, hey, there's this job reporting on Tehran, Iran. Go, here's a camera, here's a backpack, we're going to send you to Iran. So that's great, I'm so excited. I was so excited to see that country. And I mean, lots of things to share from there that I can't possibly describe now. I got to see Isfahan, I got to see the church, all that great stuff. And first my parents freaked out and they said, if you know 60,000 Armenians can do it, I guess you can do it too. So it was, there's another upshot. So I was doing all that, all this interesting work, and then came the Arab Spring. This is a Twitter timeline of how that unfolded. Because I had been consistent, I had really focused on the Middle East, and I was 25, I went over it two, in 2007, I got to know my generation. So funny thing is, if you were listening, none of this came as a surprise. Okay, Tunisia was kind of a surprise. But by the time you got to January 25th, and the revolution was going in Tahrir Square, these are all the Twitter handles that, as they rose. And all of the pictures here were from, Insta were from an Instagram feed of an Egyptian photojournalist, who I later found out is half Armenian. And I tried to convince him that we're kind of into the photography thing, and he thought I was just, <laughs> he I was just jumping on him. But no, it was real. So Egypt happened. But the people I knew told me it was going to happen. They said, if you think Tunisia was big, just wait till you see January 25th. So if you were listening carefully, it wasn't a surprise, and that's what it means to be a foreign correspondent. You're supposed to be the eyes and ears. Then came February 14th in Bahrain. Then came Lulu, which was the term for the Bahrain Revolution, February 17th in Libya, February 20th in Yemen, and finally Syria. And I noticed that because Syria came last in the order of revolutions, it got the least attention. I had seen us failed to cover the Iraq war. And I'm not talking about the weapons of mass destruction. I'm talking about 2008, 2009, 2010, when coverage of the Iraq war dropped. And I figured if we don't cover the wars we're in, we're not gonna be covering the wars we're not in. That was a problem. Problem number two, as a Middle East specialist, Syria is clearly and obviously important. So I noticed the level of consequence 
was high and the level of comprehension was underground. This was a very important series of events and we just weren't noticing. We didn't have room, we had all moved on in all of our news organizations. We just weren't interested. So that was problem number two. And problem number three is that 100 years ago, Syria took my family in. When we had our troubles, they were listening and they gave us a home and I had a debt to pay. I didn't want us forgetting them at the time of their greatest need. We should all remember that. So what I noticed is that there's barely a, basically a market failure in foreign news. Our systems weren't producing the thing that we needed in order to understand what was important. And it really came in three parts. First, over, since the early 1990s, we had seen a lot of foreign bureaus shut down because they're expensive. We had seen a lot of reporters laid off because they're expensive too. So full-time foreign correspondents were down. And that left us with a lot less reporting. Foreign news has basically been gutted. It didn't stand a chance. And the result of all that was mass confusion, an uninformed society. We consider it special or somehow unusual for people to want to know what's happening in the world. As a result, 45% of Americans said they didn't know enough about Syria to even have an opinion about striking Syria. And we are a country with a very low bar for having an opinion. So we're not reaching that bar for 45% of people. So I brought together a team of journalists and designers to create a website. This is the old version, but this was the first version, to build something we called Syria Deeply. It was an attempt to create a different delivery system. How can we create the space online where we have infinite real estate to help people understand a very important story? We had Syria files, which were the background, the history, the who's who, context. We had Google Hangouts, we had a map, we had all these features. And the impact was that we hacked the news cycle. That's what I call it when we cover something and people pick it up as a result. Because we do high-level reporting, high-integrity stuff. So because we do that, other people are happy to carry it. They just couldn't get it done for whatever reason themselves. It was really, it was not easy. Leaving TV when I had really worked to get a double correspondent job for ABC and Bloomberg and all this great stuff we love to do every day. But it, this was urgent. So it was funny when people started writing all these nice things about us because I didn't expect it. We didn't know how people would react. So suddenly Fast Company said that we outsmart the news. That was nice. And Time Magazine said we were the future of news. That was also nice. And that's like whatever, a list of things. But the, it's, this is an awkward part. I hate showing my face. But MSNBC, when, well, that's a terrible picture too, <laughs> but the, uh, when MSNBC was doing their coverage and all these channels were doing their coverage, they were asking us to come on to fill in the gap of expertise. I am not a Syria expert. I feature Syria experts, but once in a while, I will come out and share what they have told us about what's going on. And we really did our best to intervene, right? And suddenly people thought, wow, this is a model that can be really useful to other people. That was great. So we partnered with Columbia University. We wrote a book that will be out shortly. It will be FREE free um, for you journalism students out there called The Startup Newsroom, which is lessons from us and everybody else who've done things like this. But the best part, more nice things, yes, 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 okay. I mean, it, it, I show it only because we had no idea it would happen. And we had to operate in absence of anyone's approval and validation. That's a little toss to Alexis Ohanian. <laughs> Without anyone's permission, we left television. Hey! <laughs> uh, we left television. I left television to do something without anyone's permission and not knowing how it would work out. We always wait for everyone's approval. Our community is obsessed with approval. We gotta let that go. No one's gonna judge us. Especially if we judge each other a little bit less, then we can legitimately say that you're not being judged at every minute. My mother told me a lot of things before I came to give this presentation, and most of them were about my looks. <laughs> and none of which I did. <laughs> so, um, 
but we just can't. We can't. We can't worry anymore. Let's let that go. Don't worry. My dad gave me the best advice ever that he does not always follow, which is whatever you do, don't worry. Don't worry. Most of the things we're afraid of never happen. So here we are doing these nice sort of inter interchanges with people in the news who now think what we did is A-OK. -okay. And all these news outlets picked up our reporting, which meant that net-net, there were more stories about Syria. And that was great. And then we did a Google Hangout with John Kerry. That was nice, too. He gave us 36 minutes of time before flying to Geneva in order to negotiate the chemical weapons deal with Russia. We had asked for the interview. The State Department said yes. We invited Nick Kristof of the New York Times to co-host it and a teacher who uses Syria deeply in the classroom to join us and bring in questions from multiple classrooms. These are all the other things we want to do next. Pe kind of like when your kid's a doctor and people come up to him and say, I've got this thing. Can you take a look? People came up to us with their thing. Oh, my thing is robotics. You've got to do robotics deeply. Or I'm from Congo, and that's the Syria that time forgot. Can you please do Congo deeply? Or your country's at war in Pakistan. You may not see it that way, but isn't that what it's called when you bomb a place? Can you please do Pakistan deeply? So it's really hard to turn that down. So now we are going into an intense R&D cycle with some great partnerships from the Associated Press to Matter, VC. We're going to be perched in San Francisco for the next four and a half months, figuring out how we make this model work for all these other issues. We've got geographic issues that mean a lot to us. We've got strategic issues that mean a lot to everybody. And then science, technology, public health, a rather big bucket. But we needed a place to put all these things that people feel confused about. We're now also looking at diabetes deeply uh, and others. So we look for species level issues that we think are not being covered particularly well. And then we do what we can. So if we get this figured out, this is what we'll see. You know, there's this constant fear of failure when you take a chance. But I already know that where I stand right now, if it all ended now, I would be so satisfied. So as soon as I took that position, there was nothing to worry about. Oh. We've had about 60,000 teachers, sorry, 6,000, that's a little too much, 6,000 teachers who have received our lesson plans. We turned the same material from the website into an open source lesson plan for social studies teachers. We noticed that when it came to current events, all the lesson plans out there were expensive. And if you're our, for our friends who are public school teachers telling us that paying two or three hundred dollars for a lesson plan, you have to figure out how to squeeze into your calendar to teach Syria was not a practical solution. And ever, having every teacher do it on their own was also not very smart. So we started turning our journalism into lesson plans, common core friendly 40 minute act activities. So we called it Teach Deeply. And Teach Syria was the first one. And when we presented it to the National Council for the Social Studies, they told us, great, please present it, please share it, we're going to endorse it. And their teachers told us, can you please do Teach Afghanistan? Because our students have parents fighting and serving in Afghanistan, and we can't explain why. Because when the news doesn't cover it, it's harder for everybody. And Wikipedia is wonderful. I love Wikipedia, and Jimmy Wales is amazing and has been so kind to News Deeply, but it can't be the only resource when teachers aren't exactly sure what to do with it and everything else out there is dispersed. So we wanted to solve that problem. And it's all, in the end, about keeping our commitment to the story. I didn't want to leave Syria behind. And then, funny thing happened, as people started raising their hands, we sort of really sympathized, right? They say that innovation is a radical form of a radical empathy or a radical manifestation of empathy, all of those things. So uh, in July of last year, Aisha Sese, which was CNN's Africa anchor for CNN International, came to us through a friend and said, whatever was going wrong when we were telling Syria's story, I think the same thing's happening with Ebola. It was July of last year and we hadn't been hearing much about it. So she said, can you please do Ebola deeply? So we carved out whatever budget we could and just did it. We launched Ebola deeply in October of last year for a six-month run. We called it a pop-up news site. It only needs to exist as long as the crisis. So uh, it will last until May, and then we'll see if it turns into sort of an online archive. But it served a lot of people very well. 
So Ebola deeply, which you don't see here, um, came next. We've gotten thank yous from John Kerry to the UN to various branches of the UN, UNHCR to UNMIR, which is the UN uh, mission for emergency Ebola response or Ebola emergency response. Um, and it was, you know, it kind of felt like the least we could do. Um, so that was great. Oh, thanks. <laughs> And that's my last slide. This is a piece of art on a wall in Syria. So I usually end on it, but it turns out I have 11 more minutes. And even though there isn't a technically sanctioned, approved of Q&A session here, does anybody have any questions? <laughs> this is, I don't, I, very good question. I made this. I pulled this out a long time ago. I'm not sure where it is. I think it's in Holmes. I'm not positive. When you start a site, is it for if there's an ongoing crisis? Yeah. So we look at issues, as I mentioned, that are generally missing, but we look for ones that are complex and ongoing. So now we're looking at the California drought because we don't know how long it'll last, but it's a very important moment for everyone to understand how water works or doesn't. And actually, as, as I watch California go through this, it looks uh, a little bit like Yemen. Not, not physically, but the problem looks a little bit like Yemen. And the solutions might look like Israel, where they've done a lot of research on water for obvious reasons, or Dubai, where they have lots of desalination. So understanding the world through the lens of an issue that's kind of becoming the thing that we look to do. Uh, thank you. Have you any idea about what's right for Syria? <sighs> I have a lot of thoughts about that. I should say that I don't usually have, and I know what I said about opinions before, I don't tend to have an opinion. I feel like it's a bit obnoxious for me to have an opinion. It's such a complex situation, and who am I to judge the decisions people make on the ground? Um, a lot of sad things I can say. I'm going to try not to say them. But I, I did have the privilege of being in Davos this year for the World Economic Forum. And I thought it was very interesting that on one day you had a breakfast about how to stop ISIS, and another day you had a breakfast on how to save Syria, or called Saving Syria. And I was like, how do you stop ISIS? By saving Syria. <laughs> like, what's wrong? So I do think it's very important to acknowledge that if you were looking closely, ISIS slowly, slowly inched across the map of Syria. We watched it month by month. It wasn't a surprise when they then tore through western Iraq and eastern Syria and now sit on a landmass the size of the UK. We watched it in slow motion. And I've covered stories, I mean, I've, I've received them. We have about 25 journalists inside Syria on the ground contributing in Arabic, which was frankly not that shocking. If that's what, you, if you wanna get good stories, they see things I could never see. And they range from the kids who are fishing through the trash for their lunch to the guy, and this is true, all of these are true, the gentleman in Aleppo province who was a teacher, no longer has a job, has five kids and a mother who needs medical care, and chose to join ISIS for a stipend of two to three hundred dollars a month. So I was just on the radio in San Francisco, KGO, talking about Syria. And I said, oh, what are we talking about? And he said, oh, that controversy where the, the State Department said, we can't just kill these people, we have to get them jobs. How is that a controversy? I just talk to a guy who joined ISIS because he couldn't get a job. Like, that's not controversial at all. So that's true. <laughs> the fact that people are hungry and that there isn't water or electricity, the fact that I see the only time I've ever been paralyzed as from covering Syria was watching an AGBU video from Aleppo where I saw the scouts, who were like us, basically, the us's, bringing food up to the elderly in the stair, up the stairs of their apartment building. And you saw these young, healthy boys who would, be who would be playing church basketball in LA, walking up four flights of stairs, knocking on a door, and seeing an elderly woman with like all of her clothing on, because it's cold, smiling to receive their 
donations of food. That was the only time I, I was knocked me out for 16 hours. I just couldn't do anything. But other than that, and then there are so many wonderful stories. There's a guy in Damascus who decided that with fuel prices so high, he was going to start installing homemade solar energy systems that are heating water in people's houses for four hours a day. There are women starting schools in their homes. You know, there are people creating prosthetic limbs out of mannequin parts. I've seen all these things come through because we work with Syrians and we are willing to take their work in another language and spend the time translating it and teaching them what to do in the field. So there's so much to do. I came, I missed the morning, unfortunately, because there was actually a Syrian event, a Syrian conference I hosted half of at UCLA. And it was all about entrepreneurship. And I told them, I, okay, now, now, now you got me. There's a time for mourning and a time for building. And everyone in that room at the Syrian Jusur conference was ready to start building. So there's a lot we could do. And as we learn in entrepreneurship, everything big starts small. So I don't think we should be paralyzed about Syria. I think that we should be thinking about the Armenian communities of Syria. We shouldn't forget where we came from. Raise your hand if you can trace any part of your family back to Syria. I'm not going to make you raise your hand if you feel like you've done enough for Syria. But you can reflect on that on your own. We should be thinking about what we can do for the Armenians of Syria. And then, in the same moment, we should be thinking about what we can do for the Syrians of Syria. Because one of the reasons I make sure not to miss the Jasur conference is that I want them to know we remember that we have a debt to pay. We can't only think about our own communities. I love us. I really do. And um, Scout Tufengchan has this incredible book incredible book of photography from the Armenian diaspora. And as I was coming up here, I saw this quote in the beginning. I love Armenian people, all of them. I love them because they're part of the enormous human race. That was William Saroyan. So I do think that even as we mark our milestones and our hundred years, we need to put ourselves back in the human race and think of ourselves that way. I'm a Norhars. I just got married, actually, seven months ago. <laughs> and I, I got married in Armenia. And other than my family, seven, thanks. Other than my family, 70% of my guests were non-Armenian. And my Armenian friends were so amazed that they showed up. Come on, really? They were, they were, wow, you came to Armenia? Wow. And they were all fascinated by each other. The non-Armenians were fascinated by Armenia, and the Armenians were fascinated by how they were fascinated with Armenia. So it was this huge loop of fascination. Now, um, that leads me to another point I wanted to make with my remaining three minutes and 15 seconds, which is there's a phrase that I shared, and there's a lot that I shared with the people who came to Armenia for four days, and I wanted to show them the best of us. I shared this concept of radical continuity. It's not my phrase, like everything good I say, it's borrowed from Val, uh, Veronique Nishanyan, this Armenian woman who is the head menswear designer for Hermes. And I read an interview with her in The National in Abu Dhabi. And she said that the way she goes back and decides what to design is by going back into the history of Hermes and finding points where she can reintroduce it, weave it back in and create something new. Radical continuity. And that has been the theme of my life. I am as Eintabtzi as my great-grandmother. You can see it. I look like homegirl. I show up and they look, I look like homegirl. It's kind of funny. But, and then I do that. But the best part about it is that I get to keep everything we care about and change everything that we should. You know, they also say in technology that you should look to make 101% improvements. And there you go, 100%. So I look in my life for the 1% improvements. Is a note, you know, should I, should I, what should I do? There's no playbook. There's no playbook for what a Nordhars in 2015 does 
with herself on a Saturday. It's not usually on the other side of the world from wherever she's supposed to be making a home. But I, is this, I didn't want to miss this. The, the, the point being, we define what's next. We, it is radical continuity. This and Syria Deeply thing, this isn't so new. The idea that you keep paying attention, it's not that new. But we have to create a new container for it because our containers aren't really full. It's very important that we be willing to look at ourselves and make the 1% improvements. And there's nothing wrong with it. You're so lucky in Los Angeles. You have each other. You know, people, I always used to hear it when I was growing up. Oh, Armenians, we left alone. The only thing we had was the brain in our heads. So that sat with me for a while. Oh, yeah, we're great. We're so smart, fabulous. But that's not true. We have each other. It's hard, I know. It hurts, I know. The one thing I can't let go of is that phrase that still sometimes is used in Turkey that would refer to someone like me as the leftovers of the sword. And I have to ask my Turkish friends, do you ever hear that? Does anybody really use that phrase, leftovers of the sword? And they sort of have to say, yeah, sorry. I'm really sorry, but we still hear that sometimes. So yeah, it sucks. It sucks. All of it sucks. It sucks that we lost lots of things and people and, and places and connections. But all we can do is recreate what we lost with each other. Radical continuity. That's the end of it.